Hi guys, so from time to time I get recommended videos by YouTube. I, you know, I don't go searching for them, but I, I was recommended this video. This is an interview with a guy called Bruce Gilley. Now, Bruce Gilley is um, a professor of political science at Portland State University in the United States. And he's written an article recently called The Case for Colonialism. And he's received a lot of um, backlash over it. Now, he's a, a political scientist. He's a professor of political science. Um, now, I want to explain that I am not a political scientist. I have no background in political science. I, I didn't study it. Um, also, I'm, I have no background in colonialism or post-colonialism, um, which is a little bit depressing because as a layperson, I'm able to pick apart his arguments. Now, that doesn't say a lot for his position, um, but let's hear what he has to say and I'll come back with some comments. Before we get into the, the, the stuff about cancel culture and free speech and the ability for academics to debate ideas, uh, what is the case for colonialism exactly? Because colonialism now seems to be a sort of, it's like, it's like writing an article saying the case for Nazism to many people. Yeah, the, the case for colonialism is that colonialism not only made people better off, more free, it allowed them to live, survive. Okay, so it made people better off. Now, I don't know if these criticisms are legitimate or not, but which people are you talking about, Bruce? It made people better off. It made people free. Um, which people? Because as far as I know, there are two groups when we're talking about colonialism. We have the coloners and we have the, the people who uh, live under that system. We know from history that some people benefited from colonialism and some people did not. So when you say that people were richer, people were uh, better off, people were freer, which people are you talking about? Five uh, boosted um, survival rates, access to food, water. Uh... Once again, to whom? There are some, some people benefited, yes. Some people did not benefit. Are you going to say that some people, that everyone benefited from colonialism? Can you give us some, give us some examples of countries that were, uh, when they were colonized, that things improved for the general population? I know things improved for people who were at the top of the pile, but the people at the bottom, I still don't see any examples of how their lives improved under colonialism. Maybe in the long term, if you're looking at it over you know, many generations or maybe many centuries, their economies uh, improved. But the people at the very beginning, they didn't have a very good uh, time of it. Uh, protected minorities from human rights violations, especially women. So this is actually an interesting uh, comment because, uh, and I assume he's referring to India. So in India, there was the uh, a system where, for example, there was um, a criticism of a, a type of tradition. It was a limited tradition in India in the 19, it was up until the 1930s, where um, when a husband died, the wife would throw herself onto the flames um, out of, you know, I can't live any longer, any, um, you know, this tragedy in many cases because many women were not able to remarry um everything that they had was 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 owned by the husband so if the husband died they basically had nothing and there was this ritual uh to throw themselves on flames now i'm not sure exactly how uh widespread that was when the british were in india they saw this as abhorrent and they outlawed it now, you would say that's something positive, you know, in increasing the rights of women. But I think the problem is not so much outlawing an action, but understanding why that action was taking place. I think the fundamental problem was that women at the time didn't have access to these, uh, to, you know, the husband's uh, wealth or whatever. This wealth went to the children and the woman was left is pretty much abandoned. Now, the British didn't actually change anything to support those women. 
they attempted to outlaw this tradition. But once again, I'm I'm just going off what I've read. I don't know if this is true or not. Um, that's what I would call the objective side of it. But I think the real dirty laundry in the closet of most colonial writing is uh, it was legitimate too. The people supported it by and large, which is... Which people? <laughs> Are you talking about the people who were colonized? They supported it? Well, is it because they didn't rebel? Well, actually, some people did rebel. Colonialism is over in a certain extent. That's why we moved from colonialism to post-colonialism, because the colonizers left or they were kicked out. So you can't say that everyone was everyone was happy with it when we have evidence that they were not. Which is why colonial governments had practically no colonial officials on the ground. Uh, colonialism was mainly carried out by the people living in the places. Uh, what? <laughs> so when the, the like I'm once again, I'm just going from what I know and I don't know if these criticisms of mine are legitimate. But if we look at India, for example, and India is just one country that was colonized by the British. Um, and there are other forms of colonialism. You can, you know, most countries in Europe had colonies. Uh, and I'm, I'm just taking the British as an example because we, you know, we know, we generally know a bit more about them. Um, the governor or the people ruling, I should say, the people ruling India for most of the time were not Indians. They were British. The British put British people in to India to rule the country. Now, at the lower levels, yes, there were Indians um, operating the, the system. But at the top, it was British. Um, and that's what I call the legitimacy argument. So those are the two, two key pieces. Um... Once again, this guy is a political scientist. He's a professor of political science in a university. And his arguments are basically everybody benefited when that's clearly not the case. Everyone was happy when we know that there were rebellions and the people at the top were natives when we know that people at the top were not natives, they were British or they were from the country. Like we can look at pretty much any example, any country that was colonized, the people at the top, the people you know, who had direct connection to the home country were people from the home country or they were puppets generally but not generally people from the, the, the local population. We could go on ad nauseum. I have a 40 page bibliography of research that supports that conclusion. And I understand that many people disagree and they should, and we should be engaged in constant debates on this. Um, and I don't expect it will end anytime soon. Uh, the question is, um, what does it say about a school of thought when it's afraid to hear counter arguments? Well, the... um, I don't know what you're talking about. Look, once again, I'm not presenting counter arguments so much that I'm just questioning what you're saying, because once again, we, we don't um, what you're saying doesn't make a lot of sense from a logical point of view. The evidence behind rebellions, um, the resistance to colonialism was very strong. And let's let's even let me take an example of something I know even better. Ireland. Ireland was colonized by the English for hundreds of years. Are you saying that the people who were in charge of Ireland were Irish? No, they were British. They're English, sorry. Um, was there resistance from the Irish on numerous occasions? Were the people happy that they didn't have, for example, the right to vote? They didn't have uh, representation in Parliament? No, they were not happy with that. So when you're saying that people were happy, people got, and generally the population in Ireland, did the, the situation for them economically did not improve during colonialism. Some would argue it got worse. Um, so I don't know what, what he's basing his arguments upon. Like colonialism is, is extremely complex and you can't just make blanket statements to say, look, everything was better for everyone when it clearly was not the case. Speaking of the counter arguments, a lot of people who've, who've studied 
uh, history, perhaps not very much, but have studied it, would say, well, what about the treatment of starting with, let's say, take Christopher Columbus' arrival in, in North America and Central America, uh, the treatment of the, of the locals there, the treatment of the Native Americans from there on in, uh, the British Empire's conquests and oppression of people around the world, uh, in, obviously slavery, trans the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, the I, th I think you're mixing up different things here. What Columbus did was, to a certain extent, not in the United, not in North America so much. And once again, I'm not an expert on this, but as far as I know, that was not really colonialism. That was more about conquest. Uh, of course, colonialism has there's aspects of conquest in colonialism, but I think you're mixing up many different things here. And then the um, the slave trade is is something more about commerce than actual colonialism. It depends on how you define colonialism. The conquistadors in South America, surely all of that was bad, Bruce. You wouldn't challenge that, would you? I would, actually. Um, so first... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was actually expecting him to say, no, of course those things were bad. <laughs> of course slavery was bad. Of course, um, you know, taking... Uh, Vi bringing viruses into the United States that destroyed the United States, the, the, in the Americas that destroyed uh, the local population was a bad thing. That's First of all, um, most of what has been built up as uh, kind of a constant oppression, starting with Columbus, um, was anything but. Uh, Columbus was actually very sensitive to, to the locals. Um, there's a new article you may have seen in The Spectator showing... Um, I'd like to see some evidence. You know, you can point to the Spectator, which is a conservative right-wing newspaper. Um, that's not evidence. Can can we see some evidence that Columbus treated these people with respect? Um, and let's say it's actually difficult to get to that because we have to look at okay. Something about evidence is that at the time we didn't have unbiased sources. We had oral traditions from the natives and we had very biased uh, pro-Christian, pro-Spanish uh, and Italian um, conquistador uh, propaganda. So of course they would say, you know, uh, we, were, we, were, we were taking um, religion, we were taking Christianity, civilization to these barbarians. That's the, the way they would present it. Um, so it's difficult to understand how you can say that what um, Christopher Columbus was doing was humanitarian in some sense. Um, you know that th this this was a this was a settlement that was highly restrained for the time. Yes, did did he have? Kind of Why would they be restrained? Like you can make the argument, yeah, they were highly restrained for the time, or they they didn't they respected the local population. What evidence do you have to support that? And what motivation would they have to support that? Kind of uh, consultative committees and recycling uh, programs? No, but for the time, <laughs> and certainly compared to the cultures that were otherwise likely to show up in these places, it was by far the most enlightened and human rights sensitive form of it. Do we have some evidence, please, Bruce? Please provide some evidence. It's you know I can sit here and say you're completely wrong, and you can sit there and say I'm completely right. But I'd like to see some evidence to support this counter between civilizations the world has known. And I would say that's generally like as a general statement true about not just the British Empire because the British Empire is easy. It's easy to defend the British Empire. I would say this applies to. <laughs> Please, Bruce, come to Ireland and defend the British Empire. I'd love, I'd love for you to do it. I'd like you to go to India and pr and defend the British Empire. It's very easy for you to sit there in Canada or in um, in Oregon and say, "Look, the British Empire did nothing wrong." Um, wow. The Portuguese Empire. This applies to the Germans. I have a book coming out on German colonialism in about a month. We'll probably be back here because there'll be another cancel war <laughs> over that. Um, but you Just one thing about cancel. So he's he's on this show because of cancel culture, whatever. So he's he's on a YouTube channel talking about cancel culture. And this this video, I, I don't know if you can see, it has forty seven thousand views so far. 
How is that cancel culture? You know, my argument is colonial scholarship is basically a train wreck. And 50 years of ignorance have been produced by the academy. And it's going to take a lot of work to recover an authentic, objective, evidence-based account of colonialism. Was there... I, there is no objective. You can try and get to unbiased sources, but you can't have objection, objective history. It doesn't exist. Once again, I'm not a political scientist, but I know this. There is no objective history. Because history is written by, you know, the old, the old way of saying that history is written by the victors. But history is not objective. It's a collection of experiences put together and we try to uh, find out what, what more or less happened. I'm not saying that it's completely objective, uh, subjective, but it's, it's not objective. There is no objective history. There a lot of bad stuff that happened during which half of the globe was ruled by five countries, uh, billions of people over hundreds of years and billions of interactions. Of course there was, but this is called selection bias. When we find out those little incidents and then decide that they invalidate the entire experience. I don't know of a... What was the objective of co colonialism in your opinion, Bruce? Was it to make the world a better place or was it to strengthen generally European nations? Was it to make them more powerful? Was it they, they were looking at other empires and they were saying, we need um, to become stronger. And people in other countries that don't have the military power to resist us, they don't have the, um, the resources to, to fight back. We need to take uh, their resources from them. We need to enslave their people if necessary um, because we're fighting something bigger. We're fighting, you know, the British Empire, we're fighting with the Germans, we're fighting with the French, we're fighting the French, we're fighting the Germans, we're fighting the Dutch, we're fighting um, the Portuguese. We, we have to, uh, we have to, you know, slavery, taking resources from other countries, it's a means to an end. That's the way they saw it. But once again, I'm not an expert. And once again, my criticism may not be legitimate. But what tell us what was their objective because if you're saying their objective was humanitarian then why didn't they act in a humanitarian way if you're saying their um their objective was to raise all boats then why was there massive uh, uh wealth inequality if your um, suggestion is that it was about delivering democracy then why did democracy exist in britain but not in the colonies. Why did the Americans, for example, have their war of independence? A single case, and I, again, I would say not a single case where we would say the people would have been better off had the colonialists not arrived and taking into account also. Okay. But you're, what you're doing is you're looking back. You're looking back at how things resulted and you're saying, well, if, uh, if the colonialists didn't arrive, then things would not have improved. But we don't know that. How can you make an, assump make an assertion, not even an assumption, and it's an assertion that things would have been worse if the col colonists hadn't arrived? But we don't know that because the colonists arrived. You know, we don't have another universe to run this experiment through. We have the universe that we're in. Like, I, I honestly don't, like, do you have a model that you can construct to say, look, this country was colonized. In your opinion, things got better. If it wasn't colonized, things have wouldn't, would have gotten worse. Please show us the model that you have to demonstrate this assertion of yours. So, you know, the, the horrific things that happened in these places, both before colonialism arrived, what would have happened had a different set of colonizers shown up, which almost certainly would all have also been uh, gun-toting Westerners, but without the accountability to governments that actual imperialism had. What accountability? He's making assertions here. There was accountability. They were civilized. They had order. But you're not demonstrating, you're not showing any examples of that. Can you give us some examples? And... The great historical amnesia, what happened after the colonialists were suddenly forced out? 
Not a pretty picture over the last 50 years. Okay. <laughs> Max, take a deep breath. If you go into a country that has a certain culture, let's look, look, let's look at modern examples. Um, for example, Libya or Afghanistan. Afghanistan is probably a better example. So the Americans went into Afghanistan. This is a form of, you know, people will say, we, you can argue with me about if this is colonialism or not. But the Americans went to, into Afghanistan for numerous reasons. And then they said, we're going to impose democracy on the Afghans, like, the, <laughs> like perhaps the Russians wanted to do some years before. Of course, they, it was a different argument there. But they so the americans were saying we're going to impose democracy we're going to democratize um afghanistan kick out the taliban and put in democracy not really that wasn't really the um, the real motivation but that was the official that was the official argument the problem in in some of these countries um is that democracy doesn't really work because people are organized around families or clans or um social groups so, for example, you know, in people don't vote on issues; they vote according to, you know, kin. So, for example, in Afghanistan, perhaps you know, you'd have a scenario where someone is running for public office. For example, if I'm running for public office, the people who will vote for me are not so much concerned with my policies, but they're concerned with how related they are to me. In for example, on a clan level or on kinship level or a family level, people will vote for me because, I, for example, I'm their cousin or their uncle or uh, related to them in some way. They won't, they won't generally vote on policy. This is part of their culture. You know, nomadic people, for example, for them it's very important to have a tight uh, community, tight-knit community. They're not going to vote for someone on the other side of the country that they've never met uh, who's, you know, espousing particular policies. We in Europe, generally, I hope, we generally vote for people based on, their pol on, the, on the policies that they uh, represent. Of course, their connection with the local community is important, but it doesn't have to be a blood relative. It's what's important is that they're doing something for me. Uh, they're representing me in some way. In other cultures, you vote according to family connection. Now, if you're imposing democracy, uh, that's not going to work because people will not vote according to policy, they'll vote according to kinship. And democracy will not really work very well there. So when you leave, you know, you impose democracy, then you leave, you're going to have chaos because you'll have mass corruption, you'll have um, factions fighting both politically and militarily. And, and the, the colonists would say, oh, well, look, we delivered them democracy. They were incapable of um, using this tool. Once again, I'm not criticizing the people in the country. They have a different culture. Sometimes democracy is not the best tool for them. They're better organized around family units or clans, for example. So the idea that, you know, d colonialism is, is a perfect system, but when it's removed, it's chaos. Well, that's their fault. Do you think part of the problem is, Bruce, is that you, you make a case for colonialism and in a lot of people's heads, what they think is that you're making a case for slavery? Yeah, or genocide or, you know, what about, so I call this the what about arguments, right? Well, what about the, what about the Mau Mau? What about the Herero? What about the Maji Maji rebellion? What about Tasmania, right? And so this is, this is kind of what I call what aboutism. So there's two answers. No, no there's not really a what aboutism. What aboutism is something different. My God, I have to explain. What about ism is where you talk about something that's not related in order to distract from the conversation. If, if a rebellion took place within a, a colony, then we're still talking about colonialism. Now, either Bruce doesn't understand what, what about isms are, or he's pretending not to understand what, what about isms are. Just a what about ism. Yes. A lot of bad stuff happened and there's no excuse for it. And it was a failure of accountability mechanisms. 
Sure, great. <laughs> Fear of accountability. <laughs> so when the the imperialist state puts down a rebellion and kills people, that's a failure of accountability. Accountability to whom? A accountability to a, a foreign state. So if you're, if the the governor in your colony, who comes from another state, oppresses you and you rebel and you know he puts down that rebellion who do you have a, where is the accountability can you vote this person out no because in generally you wouldn't have the right to vote uh, can you put in your own people no because the system is designed to keep the local population out of power what are you talking about accountability accountability to whom once again i don't know if my criticisms are legitimate but a lot of this doesn't make any sense. Um, the second question is, though, I often look into these whatabouts more carefully, and I discover there's not much whatabout to be found there. So, as I said, I have a book coming out on German colonialism. I spent a lot of time talking about the Herero Nama wars in German Southwest Africa, as well as the Maji Maji rebellion in German East Africa. These two things are supposedly irrefutable evidence for why col German colonialism was a terrible thing. And I find both claims empty. You're injecting opinion, opinionated um, arguments into something that like, was a bad thing. Who said it was a, was it, once again, I, I think this is very lowbrow discussion. He's using a lot of subjective language here, like, and he's, supposedly a professor was a bad thing was it um anti-democratic can we use some different language here now people will disagree with me i have no problem with that um i draw upon the scholarship of many people who do agree with me that's part of what we do in academia um so you're drawing on scholarship i don't care about scholarship. what evidence do you have to support your positions if you're going to say that colonialism was good and we don't have a model to show, you know, how a country would have existed without it, then your your position is based on on flimsy, um, flimsy evidence. So, you know, the bigger issue is why are we so scared to have these debates? Why is the mere mention of an opposing viewpoint, you know, reason to rush to the cancel culture office and instigate an investigation. Uh, no, but nobody has a problem with you talking about these things. You are a political scientist. You, you work in a university. So you have a very big platform. You have written a, an article. Uh, it's been published. You're talking about The Spectator. I don't know if your article was published in The Spectator as well. So like you're talking about people are trying to silence me, but you're publishing articles. You're being interviewed on this channel. There seems to be a sort of creating a sort of phantom menace like this cancel culture he's talking about. People are trying to cancel me. People are trying to stop me from speaking. Now, let me just tell you why people are telling <laughs> people are trying to stop me from speaking. But this whole issue of um, colonialism it has been debated for for a long time now, for decades. You're not something he's not something new here. But once again, the arguments that he's making don't seem to be you don't seem to be backed up by any evidence he's just making blanket statements that everyone was better off under um colonialism and then when you give him an example for example what happened in ireland or in the united states uh, or sorry the the u.s sorry america north america or india then he'll say well that's just whataboutism which it isn't whataboutism once again is something different I'm not going to go on too much longer in this interview. I I, I will uh, link uh, to the original video if you want to watch all of it. But it is a bit difficult to to respond to because he he's not providing any evidence that we can actually look at together and see. Okay, was this objectively correct or wrong, or was this um, a, a net benefit for people, or was it a net loss? But we've seen how colonial governments have put down rebellions, have oppressed people denied them rights once again just give me an example of 
an operating democracy within a colony where you could actually choose who ran the country. Give me some examples of that. Otherwise, I think your argument, once again, is built on sand. Let me know in the comment section, guys, what you think. As always, your comments are greatly appreciated. Thanks a lot. I want to say a big, big thank you to all of my patrons. You ensure that this channel continues to exist. I'm eternally grateful for all of your support. If you join Patreon, you will receive instant access to our Discord server, where we have both audio and video chats. You can chat with me and other patrons, where we discuss important and non-important issues. Becoming a patron per month costs about the same as a large coffee. So why not check it out?